Hey, thanks for coming to 1500ESPN.com. I'm Derek Wetmore, and I'm going to share with you my five thoughts from Thursday's Twins-Tigers game. Tigers won 4-2, which snapped the Twins' winning streak. They had just come off a sweep at home here at Target Field of the Baltimore Orioles. Let's get right into it. Thought number one, uh, the Twins scored just two runs on Thursday. I'll, I'll get more into this point in, in thought number two. I, I, we're going to want to make this game about Mike Pelfrey, about the decision to keep Pelfrey in, about the bullpen, um, but sometimes it's more of a totality than that, really. I mean, when you score two runs, you're not going to win most ball games. So uh, the the reason that they lost this game is because they scored two runs. Yes, the bullpen did not get its job done. Mike Pelfrey gave up a two-strike double to Ian Kinsler. Certainly those things hurt, those impacted the final score. Um, let's not make it 100%. About that, uh, they scored their runs in the fifth inning. A couple of misplays by third baseman Nick Cassianos. Uh, Brian Dozier ended up on second base to lead off the inning on an error by the third baseman. Uh, Trevor Plouffe brought him in, and then uh, Tory Hunter also had a ball hit that way. It was originally scored an error. Eventually went back and changed. Tory Hunter got an RBI single for it. But in any case, those are the only runs that the Twins were able to muster against. Well, David Price for eight innings, and then Joaquin Soria for the ninth. Price was really good. I mean, and changeup was fantastic tonight. Paul Molitor said after the game that he thought the changeup might have been his best weapon. I talked to a couple players in the Twins clubhouse after who agreed. Said Price pitched a little bit backwards on Thursday. Uh, they weren't used to seeing that from Price. You're used to the fastball, the cutter, that kind of mix. And he was really a uh, changeup with some curveballs on Thursday. He mixed it up well and kept the Twins off balance. Um, thought number two is brief because this was kind of the big story. The big talking point uh, is that uh, Mike Pelfrey stayed in in the eighth inning, facing a couple of lefties to open up the inning. Asked Molitor after the game, any thought to go into a lefty there to get the matchup? No, he said he was, uh, it, don't take that as a shot at the bullpen. He said, we still like those guys. He just felt with the stuff that Pelfrey had and where he was at, even around, you know, as he was getting up toward 100 pitches, he trusted Pelfrey in those matchups. It was uh, with uh, Kraus and Anthony Goes in the eighth inning. Ended up uh, coming back to bite the Twins. Pelfrey gave up a couple base runners, and then Blaine Boyer came uh, in and gave up an RBI double to set the uh, final score, 4-2 to two for the Twins. So, yes, that was a critical moment in the ballgame. The Mike Pelfrey decision, Blaine Boyer not being able to hold it down. Uh, keep in mind, four runs is, uh, is not... A ton of runs to give up. It's just when you're facing David Price, the margin for error is so razor thin, especially when Price was dealing the way he was on Thursday night. Thought number three, Aaron Hicks made a bid at another fantastic catch. Losing some cups here. Uh, a bit at another fantastic catch out in center field. You remember the Willie Mays catch from the Orioles series where he just sort of basket catch over the shoulder at the warning track. Tried something similar. On Thursday, he did not come up with it. The ball ended up landing for a hit, but Hicks somewhat made up for it. It was an, an Anthony goes basically um, double, I think it was scored, out to center field. Hicks picked up the ball after it hit the ground for the base hit, throws it back in, cut off man Eduardo Nunez, relays it to the plate, and the Twins nab Nick Krause, which would have been the go-ahead run at the time. This is a 2-2 ball game in the time at the eighth inning. That run was critical, and Hicks and Nunez cut it off. Uh, impressive play, even if Hicks could not come up with a catch. I think you see K Hicks catch that ball fairly often. I don't think it was as difficult of a play as the one that he actually made against Baltimore. But nonetheless, Hicks, big range, big arm then to, uh, to make that throw, and credit Nunez for getting the relay to the plate. Thought number four, Joe Maurer bunted for a single in the first inning. Uh... No, he hasn't found new speed. He just saw that they were shifting. The Tigers put on a big shift, and Nick Cassianos was basically playing in between second and third base, I would say about halfway in between, and Maurer recognized that. Okay, drops down a bunt to the left side of the infield, made it safely. Um, I, I talked to some coaches in the summer of 2013 as, as shifts were starting to become more popular and more and more teams were using the data available to them and placing their infielders and outfielders accordingly. They said, well, I don't like hitters trying to beat the shift. You get out of your own swing, you lose your pattern, you're kind of forfeiting to the defense. And they thought, that, or at least the line of thinking at the time was, well, hey, just go with your strengths, and they're going to 
They're going to cut off some balls with these shifts, but you just got to do what you do well. I think that line of shifting, or excuse me, that, that line of thinking is starting to shift, uh, no pun intended, I guess, that players and coaches and coaching staffs are more willing to change up that strategy. Maurer was a perfect example of that on Thursday. He also bunted against uh, Oriole starter Wei-Yin Chen earlier in the week. And I think those are just a couple of examples of hitters, even of, of Maurer's ilk, who are willing to take what the defense gives them to go away from where the data says they're supposed to hit the ball and just hit it in other spots. Change up your swing a little bit. Maurer did that on Thursday by bunting successfully. Thought number five, uh, Miguel Sano struck out three times, and he was very much victimized by Price's changeup on Thursday. He said that's the best pitcher he's faced so far in the big leagues. Uh, hard to argue, although he's he's ran into some good ones. The impressive part about Sano's night on Thursday, though, because there seems to always be a silver lining with the 22-year-old, he had a line out in the, I'd have to remember what inning it was. He, the, the one ball that he did scald was in the fifth inning. Uh, he lined a ball out to center field off a David Price fastball, a first pitch of the at-bat. He charted off the bat at the exit velocity, according to StatCast, 113 miles an hour. I wrote about this in my Five Thoughts column. That's a mind-boggling number. Sano does this with regularity. In his first week in the big leagues, he's just tattooed several balls, even for outs sometimes, like was the case on Thursday. Sometimes that still rings pretty loudly, and you think, man, there's uh, there's plenty of power in that bat, even if the results aren't always there. That will do it for this Five Thoughts video. Go to 1500ESPN.com and check out my full column. Also, check out Judd Zolgad's column from Thursday about how all the young talent in Minnesota gives three of the professional sports team some reason for optimism. I'll give you a hint. The Twins are definitely one of those teams. Byron Buxton, Miguel Sano, Eddie Rosario. You go down to the minor leagues, you're talking about guys like Jose Barreos. The list could go on and on and on. Um, an exciting future, potentially, for the Twins, assuming a decent number of these guys pan out. But Judd wrote about all of that in the column on the website, so do check that out. Uh, I'm going along here, so i got to wrap up this video. But thanks again for watching. I'll check in with you this weekend as the Twins try to uh, even the series with the Tigers. Till next time, I'm Derek Wetmore. Thanks for watching.